Pada 2. The Process of Death Adhikar Note 1. At death, the organs merge in the mind. Sutra 1. Vanmanasi darshanat chabdacha Vak Speech merges. Manasi in the mind. Darshanat because it is so perceived, cha, and shabdat, from scriptural statement. Translation. The function of the organ of speech merges in the mind at the time of death, for so it is seen, and so the Upanishads say. Now, before introducing the path of the gods, meant for arriving at the result of the inferior meditations, that is, on the qualified Brahman, the aphorist first speaks of the order of the departure from the body as taught by the scriptures. He will say later that the departure is similar for both the man who has the knowledge of the qualified Brahman and the man who has not. Thus occurs the Upanishadic text about death. O amiable one, when this man is about to die, his speech is withdrawn into the mind, the mind into the vital force, the vital force into fire, and fire into the supreme deity. Chandogya Upanishad 6, 8, 6 Doubt Now the doubt arises as to whether the above passage speaks of the entry into the mind of the organ of speech together with its functions, or of the entry of the functions alone. Opponent. While under this doubt, the conclusion that can be drawn is that the organ of speech itself enters into the mind, for thus would the proper sense of the passage be honored, while otherwise one would have to resort to a figure of speech. Whenever a doubt arises about the literal or figurative meaning of a text, the literal one has to be accepted and not the figurative. Hence, the withdrawal here is of the organ of speech itself into the mind. Vedantin. This being the position, we say that the functions alone of the organ of speech are withdrawn into the mind. Opponent. How is this interpretation about the withdrawal of the functions of the organ of speech arrived at when the teachers that is, the aphorist's statement is, speech goes into the mind. Vedantin. This is true, but later he will state, the parts, that is, the organs of the enlightened man, merged in Brahman, become non-distinct from it on the authority of the scriptures. Sutra 4.2.16 Hence, it is understood that what is meant here is merely the cessation of the functions of all in general. If, however, the merger of the organ of speech itself be meant, then, since the non-distinction is the same everywhere, for the enlightened and the ignorant, why should the aphorist make a separate mention of it in the case of the enlightened, by saying non-distinct in Sutra 4.2.16? So the intended meaning here, beating the cessation of the functions of the organ of speech, the idea conveyed is that the functions of the organ of speech become withdrawn, even while the functions of the mind continue. How can this be so? Because it is seen to be so. For it is a matter of experience that the power of speech stops earlier, even while the power of the mind still continues. Not that the withdrawal of the organ of speech together with its functions into the mind can actually be seen by anybody. Namaste. Thus begins the second pada of the fourth chapter of Brahma Sutra. 
This pada describes the process of death or withdrawal of the subtle body from the gross body. I think way too many people are afraid of death because they don't understand it. They don't realize that the subtle body, which people consider to be the soul or the essence of the individual, is permanent within the existence of the entire universe, and that only the gross body is perishable. So the subtle body also dissolves at the time of final enlightenment, but we're not there yet. <laughs> the sutras describe the process of death for both the unenlightened and the enlightened beings. So what is this process? Well, in a nutshell, it's simply the withdrawal of the mind and the powers of the senses, the functions of the senses from the gross body. How is it that the functions of the senses are withdrawn into the mind? Well, consider our experience in dreams, svapna consciousness. In dreams, we see, hear, speak, move, and so many other things. I think in my dreams anyway, there's less emphasis on taste and smell. But the other functions of the senses are quite intact. Even though the sense organs of the gross body are nowhere to be found. <laughs> Only the dream body, the subtle body, exists in the dreams. So, the functions of the senses are distinct from the senses themselves. They are part of the mind. So, when the mind and the rest of the subtle body withdraws from the gross body at the time of death, the functions of the senses are withdrawn into the mind. The Buddha mentions this in the Paticca Samuppada, the process of dependent arising. He says that after creation of the fabrications and the consciousness, then the six sense bases are created. Now, the sense bases are the functions of the senses as distinct from the physical senses themselves. So, in other words, even before the existence of the body, <clears throat> the ears, eyes, and so forth, all these sense functions exist in the mind. Just as in the case of the material elements, if you study Sankhya, the essence of the elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space, are contained in the Mahatattva. Not the physical elements themselves, but their essence, their functions. So the same thing that goes on in the macrocosm is ob also observed in the microcosm of the human being. That the senses and their functions are actually different and distinct. I had a chance to observe this process closely on the departure of my sannyas guru, Jnana Shakti Swami. He was staying at a, a home for aged sannyasis really a hospice for those approaching death. So he got expert care from some very advanced sadhus during the final weeks of his life. And this is the time when he actually gave me sannyas. I had been looking for a sannyas guru for many years and couldn't find anyone qualified. That is, I couldn't find anybody more realized than me. <laughs> of course, I want to take sannyas from someone more advanced than me. Not less advanced. I'm not interested in sannyas as a decoration for my ego or something like that. I'm interested in sannyas 
as a means of connection with a higher stage of realization. So when I approached him while he was in the hospice and he was still more or less present in the body, and I begged him for the sannyas, he gave it immediately. <laughs> I guess he figures, oh, what do I have to lose, right? <laughs> but no, really, he felt that I was uh, advanced enough that I deserved it. And so he gave it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have. And so I got to observe him withdrawing from the body. That first, he stopped talking. He wouldn't say anything. And then he stopped eating. And that's when the other sannyasis told me, oh, he's, he's going to leave soon. So I was very careful to visit him every day. And one day I came about 9.30 in the morning, and <clears throat> the sannyasi came running out and said, oh, he's gone. He just took his last breath. So I came, and knowing that he was still conscious, even though the breathing had stopped, the uh, mind activity in the body, in the brain, goes on for like 15 minutes. They wanted to move him, and I said, no, don't move him. Leave him be. Let him withdraw from the body completely, which takes a few minutes. Don't be in a rush. And so I went into meditation right on the spot. I just sat down and went right into it and got in tune with him. And sure enough, you know, he was still present to some degree. So it's not like death happens, boom, you know, immediately. It's a gradual process of withdrawal of the senses and the mind from the body itself. And this can happen over days or even weeks before one takes one's last breath. Now, why is it important to understand the process of death? Because this is the time when the results of one's meditation and sadhana in the previous life become manifest. That's why this pada, or this chapter actually, the whole chapter, is called Pala, P-H-A-L-A, Pala, which means results, or literally means fruits. So the results of one's meditation and sadhana are experienced in full at the time of death. Therefore, one has to be extremely alert at that time, not to fall into illusion, not to desire those gross senses and gross body, but to desire only one's highest spiritual conception. This is why it was discussed at the end of the first pada that the meditation has to continue up till death. In fact, even during the process of death, the meditation process must continue to bring one to the highest stage, because whatever you think of at the time of death determines the result, the status, the state of being in the next life. So, of course, most people, their mind's very disturbed and they're confused at the time of death, and they think about their previous life and, oh, how I'm losing my body and so on like this. And so they get another gross body. But one who is in meditation at the time of death doesn't want a gross body. No, I don't want to go through that again. I want to go to a higher plane. I want to go to the qualified Brahman or the unqualified Brahman. Saguna Brahman or Nirguna Brahman. And the path or the after-death state of both of these are going to be described in detail in this pada. Aum Tatsat, Aum Shakti Aum, 
ओम नमः शिवाय